Would you join me this morning in the book of Ephesians? It uh, feels like we've been going through the book of Ephesians forever um, and off and on. That's kind of true. We actually started going through the book of Ephesians before COVID um, and then COVID. And then we resumed in September of 2020 and then in bits and pieces we've worked our way through most of the book. Um, we've come to the last section of the book that is known at least by name to many Christians as the armor of God. And I want to take time this morning, we're going to look at chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, and what I want to do is prepare us over the next number of weeks to look at the individual pieces of the equipment of the armor of God, but what I hope to do this morning is to convince you what the point of them is. Like, why do we need the armor of God? What is it supposed to to do. And I think if we can understand this handful of verses that we'll look at this morning, it will position you well to even inform your own understanding today, but then help you know what the significance is of each of these various aspects of armor. Uh, Paul goes on to articulate six of them, pieces of equipment that he says we need to put on in order to stand ultimately um, faithfully with Christ in the end. So we're in Ephesians chapter 6. I'd like to read to you as you read along verses 10 through 13, and then we will consider this paragraph together. This is the word of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. This is the word of the Lord that we will consider this morning. As we begin, I want to um, give appropriate credit where credit is due. Um, what I want to share with you this morning is what I think is a logical, is like the logical ordering of the statements that I just read to you. Frankly, I don't understand exactly why the Apostle Paul ordered them in the way that he did. There are several commands in there. There's a command to be strengthened, a command to stand firm, a command to put on the armor of God. Um, much like when you give instructions to everybody, if you give too many instructions at the same time, people don't really know, like, are these, like, in sequential order? Is this, like, one, two, and three? Is it saying the same thing three different ways? Like, how do we even hear this instruction? So, I want to present to you what I think is the logical progression of these commands that move towards one ultimate command, to stand firm. So um, my understanding of this has been heavily influenced by a former pastor named John Piper, who um, has a resource he makes available online called Look at the Book. It's actually pretty compelling. Um, he just walks through passages of the Bible um, and helps you understand what they're saying and does it visually. So if John Piper was here this morning, that would be awesome. I would sit down and we would let him give the message, but he's not here today. So I'm going to give the message. So if you take a look at this look at the book thing and you go through this series of videos on the armor of God, you're going to be like, that's where my pastor got that. He totally lifted that. Um, it's only plagiarism if you make it sound like it's your own. It's not my own. Okay? Well, that's good. All right. So um, here's the statements. If you're a note taker, this is right up your alley. If you're a note taker, I'm sorry that I didn't print it in the bulletin ahead of time. Then you could have saved it in the bottom of a drawer for years and then thrown it away five years from now. You wouldn't do that. Yes, you would. Okay, so here's the statements. This is how I understand the argument that he's making. We wrestle with evil spiritual forces. That's the reality. So we must put on the armor of God to be strengthened with Christ's might so that we can withstand the schemes of the devil and stand firm. So I just want to take this phrase by phrase and Lord willing, um, inspire you to see the significance of putting on the armor of God. 
So we wrestle with evil spiritual forces, not primarily physical ones. We've spent much time on this over the past few weeks. So I just want to remind us, all throughout the book of Ephesians, Paul has in mind like this cosmic battle, this contest for the well-being of God's creation. Yeah, picture it now. Picture yourself above the earth. You are in the heavens. You're in the sky and you're looking down on planet earth. This is a way you can picture this. God who has existed forever and lacks nothing, because his character is love, it appears as though he makes the world as an expression of his love and his bounty, that he would make people in his image that would be like him, to know him, and to know the joy that he himself is for all eternity. So like this experiment, this project is earth, and the people on it are us, made in his image, but we're like looking down on this thing. So while God is conducting his experiment. The evil one is like, hey, I want to be God. I want to do that. So the evil one has infected the creation with the notion, wait a minute, I, I, I know better. I want people to worship me. Why should God be able to have all that fun? Like, have you ever seen kids fight? You bring out a toy, and then all of a sudden, they're like devouring each other over this little toy. Think of it like that. God makes the earth, and Satan is like, ooh, I want that. Give me that. Mine, mine, mine. And God is like, no. The evil one thinks he wins a victory by corrupting the humanity. He corrupts the people on the earth. It's almost like he does an end around God. He doesn't because the evil one is not as smart as God. The evil one doesn't realize God is orchestrating a master plan. But the evil one thinks he's smarter than God. And so he infects humanity with this notion we don't really need God. And so instead of God having unbroken enjoyment with his creation and the creation having unbroken enjoyment with him, now we get a separation introduced and the evil one is trying to corrupt and steal and defile and defraud what is happening on the earth, which is why sometimes you think you're God, which is why we think we know better, which is why we get offended and defensive when people correct us. It's why we feel all kinds of left out and lonely when people don't see how awesome we are. Like the whole creation is corrupted with this desire that we don't really need God, we can be our own. So in this contest, like, okay, you're, for this thought experiment, you're looking down on the earth, except for in real life, you're on the earth. You didn't make it, you didn't make yourself, you are not someday, like some cults would suggest to you, you are not someday going to have your own world and form your own planet. No, that will surely not happen for you. You're a creature on the earth that God made. You live in God's story. In the cosmic story of what God is doing, the evil one has attempted to ransack it. Nobody is Switzerland. The battle is not optional. You're caught up in it. Your option is either to put on the armor of God or get your butt whooped because the evil one does not fight fair. We live in a corrupt, fallen world that the evil one is currently the one who has authority over. The scriptures talk of him as the prince of the power of the air. He has an authority in this world. So the battle is not optional. There is a spiritual battle. It's not primarily physical. Your greatest enemy is not your spouse, not your boss that is self-centered and egotistical. Your greatest enemy is not your rebellious child. Your greatest enemy is not your terrible parent. Your greatest enemy is not cancer. Your greatest enemy is not anything physical. Those are physical expressions or manifestations of the spiritual darkness and sickness that has infected God's good creation. That's the reality. We live in a spiritual battle. We live in a spiritually contested reality. Paul has spoken of this often in Ephesians. Back in the very first chapter, uh, verse 10 says, what God is doing is uniting in Jesus all things, things in heaven and things on earth. 
This is one of the most common themes in the book, this cosmic struggle for creation. So Jesus, verse 20 and 21 of chapter 1 say, Jesus has been placed because of the cross and the resurrection. He has been placed far above all the rule and authority and power and dominion. Chapter 3, Paul reiterates and reminds us that God who created all things is doing this so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Right? The, the heavenly places, um, think of it like um, layers or tiers or concentric arcs of heaven. Because of the language of the scriptures, the word for heaven can mean just sky. Like heaven starts like one inch above your head in the Bible. Just the sky is heaven. But heaven is also like where Jesus dwells. Like, right, Jesus now resides at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Well, that's not like one inch above your head. That's like, woo, I mean, way up there somewhere. Somewhere pictured as up. But up, the heavens, up in other tiers is also where the evil one reigns and dwells. So Ephesians five times uses the language of heavenly places. So there is a battle. We wrestle with evil spiritual forces. Second phrase, so we must put on the armor of God. Assuming you want to be protected assuming you want to be victorious. If you as a child of God do not equip yourself with the armor that God provides, you are going to get worked. Yes, God loves you. You can be a child of God. You can be with Him for eternity, but you can neglect to do what He tells you to do, and then you will get whooped on because the evil one does not play fair. The armor is necessary for us to put on. We have to put on the armor of God. That's our responsibility. These next two phrases, I think they highlight very well two truths that we must hold in tension. We must put on the armor of God. But the third phrase is, so that we might be strengthened with Christ's might. You have to have both. You have to put on the armor of God if you want to be able to withstand the evil one and to stand so that you can know Christ's might. Th these two go together. The way that you know Christ's power in your life, if you live a life that you feel like is absolutely lacking the power of Christ, you cannot for the life of you overcome your habits and patterns of sin. You cannot, for the life of you, live outside of yourself. You're constantly consumed by your own cravings for materialism, for status, for comfort, and it just seems like you can't break free from that. You're not making any progress in knowing God any better. You don't know the Bible any better. You, you, you can't spend even more than 15 minutes alone with God praying you haven't shared the gospel or anything like it with someone in forever. Like you, you, if you have a life that lacks the power of Christ, well, then I would suggest you've like neglected to put the armor on. Now, I'm not saying you're not a Christian. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. But you're designed to know the power of Christ in your life. You have to put on the armor. Now, if all you do is focus on, I have to put on the armor, I have to, I better, I have to put my helmet on, I have to get the belt, I have to, I have to, I have to, then you begin to overestimate your own significance and importance. And then following Jesus ends up becoming about your own exercise of willpower. Yes, you must leverage yourself, but that alone is not enough. You have to do both. When he says, it's in the beginning of verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. The command to be strong is actually, um, the language is passive, meaning you have to be strengthened. You have to receive strength. You have to receive the strength of another. You do that by putting on the armor and you receive the strength of Christ. 
But if all you do is have in mind the strength of Christ, Christ does everything. It's all about the strength of Christ. And you remind yourself only of things like God is sovereign. God has all the power. God knows everything. All things work according to the counsel of God's will. God works all things for the good of those who love him. God wins in the end anyway. God doesn't need me. What difference does it really make? God is strong. God is powerful. God will win. Yay, yay, yay. God, 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 God. But you don't put on the armor. What's going to happen to you? Like, Team Jesus will win. He did make all the promises. Like, Team Jesus wins the battle. But if you don't put your armor on, Team Jesus is going to win the battle, and we're going to have to carry your carcass on a stretcher to victory. Because the evil one doesn't fight fair. We have to do both. We have to keep these truths in tension. So we put on the armor of God so that, then the third phrase, we can be strengthened. This is how we are strengthened with Christ's might. The same words in this passage, strong, strength, might, in verse 10, they're the same three Greek words that show up at the very beginning of the book. The immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might. We wrestle with spiritual forces. We must put on the armor of God so that in order to be strengthened with Christ's might. So that, the fourth statement, we can withstand the schemes of the devil. That Jesus tells us in John chapter 8 is a liar through and through, a liar and the father of lies. He lies to us. These are some of the lies we've considered over the past few weeks. Without the armor, you will believe these lies. We tend to believe these lies even with the armor on sometimes. These are lies we're tempted to believe. We're lies about the necessity of obedience. Eh, sometimes we like to think obedience is optional. No, that's a lie. We get lied to about the consequences of sin. So you've told yourself it's not really that big of a deal. This will be the last time you do it. You'll get over it. It's not really going to hurt anyone. All lies. Even one lies to us about the confidence we can have in God's character. The evil one tempts us, just like he tempted Jesus, to step out from humble dependence, to step out from the will of the Father, to step out from the power of the Spirit, meet our own needs, go our own way, like the evil one tempted Jesus. We're tempted to, to insist that God prove himself more before we take steps of faith. Have you done this? God, I know that that's what your word says. I really feel like that's what you'd have me do. But God, if you could just, I just need a little bit more. You've done this. I've done this. I just need a sign. God, I just need a little bit more. It's what the evil one did to Jesus when he took him up to the highest place of the temple and said, throw yourself down. Come on, the Bible says God will rescue you. And Jesus says, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Like, we, we're tempted. We're tempted to believe that somehow God has to prove a little bit more of his faithfulness, and then we could trust him. And as we considered last week, I think maybe one of the most fundamental lies of the evil one, one of our most fundamental temptations is to live with ourselves at the center to put ourself at the center of life, to believe that the satisfaction of my cravings, my desires, is the epitome of life. As though the one who has the greatest joy is the one who can check off all their desires that they've had get met. Jesus said, no, you have to take up your cross and follow him. This is the temptation to have the crown before you have the cross. Jesus was tempted to do this. We have to withstand the schemes of the devil. To withstand the schemes of the devil, we need the strength of Christ. To have the strength of Christ, we must put on the armor of God. All of these things go together. If you want to stand against the schemes of the evil one, I mean, the picture is there is an onslaught. Most of the weapons that are articulated in this armor are a defensive posture, only one is offensive, and I think even that offensive weapon, the sword, is actually for defending oneself. Um, like me, you may have grown up 
in a church that taught kids the song Onward Christian Soldiers. Does ring a bell to anybody? Onward Christian Soldiers. I'm the only one? No, I'm not. Marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. And as a little boy, I'm like, mm, sign me up. Be a little God soldier. This isn't the imagery. Paul is painting the picture of a world that is contested. Remember the earth, God's creation experiment that is trying to be ransacked by the evil one. You are not a little creature on this earth that God is saying, go on the offensive and slay the evil one. That's the work of the king, our conquering hero. It's mostly defensive. We, we withstand. So he says this um, twice. Look at the, the parallelism. He tells us there's two comments about putting on the armor that are the same. Verse 11 and verse 13 are parallel. Verse 11 starts, put on the whole armor of God. Verse 13 starts, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. And then they say the same thing in the next phrase in two different ways. Verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Verse 13, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. We must use the equipment that God gives us. We wrestle with spiritual forces. This is the imagery of the end of the book of Ephesians. I, I want you to know, I think this is critical to know. It's not like the book of Ephesians is making an argument that uses, I want to say this. The end of the book of Ephesians summarizes all of the truths of the book. Paul has used all kinds of different images in Ephesians. Sometimes I think it's common. My observation is that it's common for Christians to think that spiritual warfare is like one more aspect of being a Christian. It's like one more thing you need to get good at. That's not how Paul uses the imagery. Paul has used lots of different images through the book. He uses the language of growing up like a child. He's describing the same reality. He talks about it at the end of the book like warfare. Earlier in the book, he talks about it like maturity, like a child growing up to mature manhood. And then he uses a different image. Maybe you remember this when we went through the section of the book. He talks about putting off and putting on. Remember, put off habits and, and lies of the old man and put on new habits, new truths, new aspects of identity. It's the same truths. In that language, is talked about as putting off and putting on. And then he uses a different imagery. He does walking. So most of chapter 5 talks about walking in light, walking in love, walking in wisdom. And then he moves on to another image, being filled with the Spirit. And then now, at the end of the book, he uses the imagery of warfare. We should not think, oh, okay, first I must learn how to grow up in Christ. And then once I learn to grow up, then I move on to the next image. And then I have to get good at putting off and putting on. And then once I've done that, then I'm ready to move up to the next image. Now I need to learn to walk. First, I must learn to walk in love, then walk in light, then walk in wisdom. And then once I've figured that out, then I can be filled with the Spirit. And then once I've learned how to be filled with the Spirit, submitting to the authority that God has placed in my life, then I am ready for special training. I am ready for the Marines of Christianity spiritual warfare. No, it is not so. That's a misunderstanding of the book. He's reiterating the same truths over and over again. They're just different images. So, the reality is that we wrestle with spiritual forces. We must put on the armor of God in order to be strengthened with Christ's might so that we can withstand the schemes of the devil and ultimately the fifth phrase, verse 13, the way it ends, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. This is the Lord's will for you if you are in Christ. This is the Lord's instruction for you how to do it. Because you live in a contested place. So you better put the armor on. 
so that you can know the strength of Christ to withstand the the lies of the evil one and ultimately, in the end, to stand. Christ has already won the victory, and He invites you to use His strength to be able to stand. The evil one will lie to you, and that doesn't even speak to your own flesh. The devil's not our only enemy, but if we are going to stand then we must do what God says. So, we're going to spend the next handful of weeks considering each piece of the armor of God. And what you need to remember is that the whole point of the armor is to stand. The point of having the helmet of salvation is not so you can have the shiniest helmet, as though when the battle is over, people will look at your helmet and be like, dang, soldier! You can see my reflection in that helmet. It's not the point. You have the helmet to stand. You have the belt of truth to stand, the sword to stand, the gospel readiness as shoes so that you can stand. The whole point is to stand. So Christ, who has fought for us and does win in the end, offers us the opportunity to stand with him. If you will put the armor on. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.